Hi everybody, this is Brennan. I'm the International Development Manager for the Blue Continent Alliance. And today we're recording our first ever podcast for what we're launching as the Blue Continent Podcast. I'd like to put these out every once or twice a week, featuring conversations with global development experts. Uh, today we had the opportunity to speak with Simon Lacey, an Australian who is now a lecturer on international trade at the University of Adelaide. Uh, but uh, has advised on trade in many, many more countries, uh, more than 30, actually, including all continents. Uh, so without further ado, so I just wanted to say uh, to anyone who's, who's listening, uh, what this program is about, this podcast, what makes it unique is, is finding people who have knowledge or expertise or have worked in uh, one capacity or another to move the football forward, as we say and uh, to, to address in a sustainable way uh, a lot of global development issues in a way that I don't think is being talked about by uh, too many other people. So, um, and, and so with that, I just want to uh, welcome our, our guest here, which is uh, Simon Lacey, uh, who uh, has developed a profile and, and written extensively about some some interesting aspects of global trade and have worked as a, an international advisor to uh, governments and uh, organizations around the world. Uh, so for that, I want to say thank you and, and give you the opportunity to tell a little bit a little bit about your background. <clears throat> okay, thanks for that. So look, I, I trained as a as a I was educated and trained as a lawyer. Um, in Switzerland mostly, even though I'm originally from Australia. And um, I, uh, uh, after a couple of years, um, I ended up kind of back uh, in academia working at a think tank uh, in, in Switzerland. And we, um, we ended up doing quite a bit of work in developing countries, helping them uh, to improve Improve their capacity to strengthen their institutional capacity to, to negotiate WTO accession. So, you know, the, the, the process by which you join the WTO. Um, or in, in the case of some other countries, uh, we, we help them increase their institutional capacity to um, implement WTO commitments that they had taken when they had joined the WTO. Um, and then as that program went along, we, we ended up expanding its scope to um, other countries in other regions who were already WTO members, but who also had a need to increase their uh, trade policy capacity to be able to, um, to engage in trade negotiations a bit more effectively. So, um, so that's how I, I kind of got started in this business. That was in the early 2000s. And um, I mean, now it's 2020 and, and I've worked in, in over 30 countries wow. um, on a whole range of issues. Um, I mean, always trade, international trade, but, um, you know, I've done trading goods, trading services, IP, and then different, um, different areas of the whole trade in goods dynamic, particularly sort of technical barriers to trade or sanitary or phytosanitary measures. Hey, Daddy, Daddy's got a meeting, yeah? Can you wait outside? Honey, Daddy's on a call. Can you grab her? Thank you. That's good. <laughs> so, um, sorry, yeah, just. Uh, it, it's very uh, apropos for the time. Yeah. Just... yeah. Mm. So, but I also, I mean, I took a couple of years out of from doing that um, to uh, to work in the private sector. Um, so I, I ended up working for a big Chinese technology company that mm. um, had put together. A, a team of sort of trade experts when it started facing um, market access and freedom of action issues in a number of its, its markets. So particularly trade remedy actions in the EU, um, anti-dumping cases, uh, countervailing duty or anti-subsidy cases. Um, and, and so this company put together a team of uh, trade experts to work within its global government affairs um, division and, and we sort of managed those issues for it. Um, so I did that for a few years, and then just this year I kind of came back to academia, and again uh, I'm working in the sort of trade and development space. So since being back um, in in the in the position I am in now at the University of Adelaide, I've I've, I've been back to the Pacific, uh, to Papua New Guinea um, most recently, 
where again we were we were helping to raise their institutional capacity to be able to engage in these negotiations and in particular the the job there was to prepare them for upcoming bilateral negotiations with China over an FTA or a planned uh, free trade agreement with with China that yeah. should happen in the next sort of one to two years. Well, that's yeah. that's very interesting. Uh, coming back into academia now, uh, is that something? And coming home, is that something that you had intended to do before the crisis, or you ended up coming back because it was the most logical thing to do? Look, I mean, I, 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 I had kind of decided, I'd been in China for five years and I decided that that was really long enough. Um, mm. And I, I would have been open to staying in the private sector and doing more government relations and international trade work. But that international trade work, it's a very niche sort of field. And there aren't really that many companies that, that hire a lot of trade experts. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, this Chinese tech company had, just because they'd had a, a number of um, anti-dumping, anti-subsidy cases in the EU over a period of sort of two or three years, and they felt like they needed some in-house capacity to be able to deal with it. Most companies just don't really feel that need. The exceptions would be companies like Airbus or Boeing or Embraer, who, you know, have been involved in decades worth of dispute settlement actions, um, they would have a certain number of people in-house who are specifically uh, trained on, on trade policy issues. But for the, rest, uh, for the rest of the corporate world, they usually just outsource that and they, they, when they need expertise on that, they pick up a phone and call a lawyer. Uh, so um, so I, I was sort of looking to, to work in another um, uh, company in, in that space, but um, that, that just didn't end up working out. And, and, you know, my profile had a lot of, um, I mean, my career had a lot of time in um, academic institutions and doing kind of development consulting work. And the role that I'm in now, that's really what they wanted. So they're embedded in an academic institution. They do a lot of the research and a lot of the teaching, but they also have a very big portion of the work, which is development consulting. And so, yeah. You know, there's just um, there just there's, there's no real sort of more ideal place for me to be uh, right now. And the great thing about you know being back in academia, of course, is that um, I don't I don't need to ask permission uh, when I want to do a podcast like this. So if I'd have wanted to do this when I was in my old job, there would have been like three levels of clearances that I would have had to have gone through oh, to be able wow. to do it. Well, it's China, uh, and they would have. And they, yeah, but, but, you know, technology, any technology company um, and any, uh, you know, Fortune 500 company, they're very um, particular about their public messaging. So, um, you know, they would have wanted to know, you know, who is this guy? What does he want to talk about? What are the sub, what are the questions in advance? Right. Uh, who is his audience? And, you know, in academia, we're just a lot more relaxed about that. So that, that, that's, that's been a breath of fresh air. And I, you know, I actually wanted to do a bunch of media interviews when I was in my old job. Oh. And, um, and that never happened. But then as soon as I left my old job, within like a month, I'd done four media interviews. So, oh. um, so it's just a lot more freedom in academia, of course, to, to say whatever you want to say to whoever you want to say yeah. it. You know? Yeah, that's that's great. Uh, what's it like for your family being back in Australia? I don't I don't know. Had you lived there since you had children? No, no look, I left Australia in 1991 um, to so that you know more than 30 years ago. Well, almost 30 years ago now. And um, I uh, had been in China for five years. So I met my wife in China, and we we had uh, a baby in China. And so she had um, lived overseas. I mean, she did all of her undergrad in the UK. Uh, and her master's in the UK. Um, so she, she had lived overseas and speaks English. Um, but uh, um, it was, I, I look, I think it's still a bit of a culture shock uh, for her. And I think um, the shutdown, you know, the, the, the kind of international travel restrictions have made it harder because I think, you know, she would have, she would have either gone back to China now on, on holiday or her, her parents would have come to, to visit. But um that, that just wasn't possible, and so um, I think it's been it's been tough. But I mean, we you know we, this is a decision we took together, and we we thought that this would be better for uh, our, it would be better for our daughter to grow up here, um, just because uh, 
the, the school system in China is very competitive, um, very high pressure. I mean, that's true all over Asia, very competitive, very high pressure. Um, and, and, you know, children don't actually have much of a childhood so much as they just um, being drilled from a very early age to, to learn as much as they can, as soon as they can. So we just felt, you know, uh, as a place to grow up, um, Australia would be, Australia would be, uh, would be better for her. But, you know, there, there's an upside and downside to everything, you know. I mean, um, uh, you know, I mean, we, we, we're definitely weaker in, in STEM and, and, um, mm -hmm. and other, other mathematics. I mean, other things in, in, in the West than, than they are in China. That's true. It's a pretty so, big decision when you decide where you want your kids to grow up, you know? It's, it's really a good one. Yeah, look, I, I mean, I, I didn't grow up all, at, all my life in Australia. I only spent about 10 years uh, in Australia when I was uh, growing up, but they were very formative years. And what part um, of the country did you, were you born in? So I was born in Australia and then we left and uh, we moved to the UK. I was in the oh, no, UK. I mean, and what, what part of Australia were you born in? Sydney. Oh, I was born in Sydney. Yeah, yeah, but I'm now in Adelaide though, but uh, but yeah, I was born in Sydney and um, and had really only spent about, uh, I want to say about 10 years in Australia before I left uh, in 1991 and, and so I've actually, I, 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 it's still the case that I've spent more time outside of Australia than I have in, in Australia. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh so I was, I was going to ask, uh, in, in all of that career progression that you described, and I would like, I love if you, if you told more about some of the, the countries where you, where you've been asked to work, but, um, if, if you could say what has been kind of your guiding principle as you, you kind of like chose different works, what were you looking for or what, uh, what drew you, what aspect of, of work drew you to these places? Well, look, I mean, when I started out doing the international trade work, I, I was in a think tank and I was really just glad to get that job because um, I didn't want to, I didn't want to work in a big commercial law firm anymore. And, um, and I spent kind of a year uh, at uh, another university just kind of teaching, being a teaching assistant. Um, and then, uh, but it wasn't really related to the field that I want to be in, which was international law. And then, um, and then I, I landed this, this job at this think tank, which is the World Trade Institute in Bern. And it had actually just started. Um, and so I was kind of like their first academic hire. And, um, and right off the bat, I mean, about a year into, the, into that job, they landed a big contract with the Swiss um, State uh, Secretary for Economic Affairs, SECO. And their interests were already defined. So they were... They were interested in Central Asia and um, Azerbaijan. Um, so I, the first countries I ended up working in were Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Azerbaijan. Had, and you, then, ever been there, uh, had you ever been there prior to that? No, I, I looked, these were countries that didn't even exist when I was studying geography in high school because they were part of the former Soviet Union, right? Yeah. So they, they only, you know, began their existence as independent sovereign states in the 90s um so no i'd not i'd not i didn't have any experience with them at all and um it was just thrown in the deep end so that that it started out with those countries and then then we ended up also doing some work in the ukraine um and then um we also ended up moving into southern africa so i was in south africa i was in mozambique in tanzania um, and then we actually also pivoted towards Southeast Asia, so I ended up doing some work in Vietnam and also Thailand. Um, then there was some, some other work in Singapore, Taiwan, so more, more developed countries, um, Sing Singapore, Taiwan. And then, and then, look, and then I ended up actually leaving and moving because we'd been, we'd been doing some work in Asia for a while and I realized I wanted to be in Asia because I just felt that was a much more dynamic environment. Um, and so I ended up moving to Singapore. And then once I got to Singapore, I ended up getting a lot more work in the region, um, particularly in Indonesia. So how long would I, you stay I, at most of these appointments? How long would you stay there? So the developing contracts were usually you know, about a month, two months. Indonesia ended up being a bit longer. Advising um, on what kinds of things? So usually I'd be embedded in the Ministry of Trade. 
and I'd, I'd be helping them on a specific issue or with, with, with a view to a specific um, uh, objective or so look in Indonesia I was embedded in the in the legal bureau of the Ministry of Trade and we were helping them raise the capacity of their trade lawyers um, and uh, you know they had a few things going on when I was there so they they had an anti-dumping case with Korea we advised them on that although that was a bit um, politically sensitive because we were a US uh, sponsored um, project that was a USAID funded project and they didn't really want to advise the Indonesian government on trade remedies because the US is a big user of trade remedies, including uh -huh. against Indonesia. Huh. Um, but we, we advised them on a case against Korea, so that, that was fine. And then um, they also had a, a um, trade policy review conducted by the WTO in 2007. I was there for that, we helped them with that. So, you know, they were, you know, it just depend, depended on what kind of things they were going through. And, but, you know, I mean, in these countries, there's always a dearth of expertise um, and anyone that shows up and, and you know, knows these issues yeah. can, can be put to good use if the government wants, wants to do that. And yeah. what was what specific part of your education made you a really uh, effective person in these roles? Mm -hmm. like, well, I think... Um, what was it that you knew how to do that they really needed to know? Well, look, I think the, the thing about international trade is that it's a, it's a real kind of um, niche area, as I said before, it's, and it's, it's not rocket science, but it's definitely a bit of a priesthood, and, and it's a very sort of specialized area of knowledge that you don't really cover in law school. I didn't study it in law school at all, and, and um, economists don't go into that much detail. I mean, you know, there are trade economists and stuff, but it's kind of like sub-discipline of, of more prestigious areas of economics. And so um, it's very niche. Uh, and even political scientists or, you know, political economy guys, I don't necessarily, you know, they study interest groups and how interest groups interact to, mm. to create the political outcomes that they want, but they don't necessarily study the political economy of the well, trading system. So it's a very niche field. It doesn't matter what kind of um, approach you take to it, what dogmatic kind of approach you take to it, whether it's economics, law, or political economy. Um, it's very niche, and none of the people at the ministry had had any formal training in it. Uh, and that was, you know, the only people that knew anything about it were the people that had been working in it for a few years. So it's learning by doing. And so when I first started, like when I first went out to Kyrgyzstan and these countries. I, I was also just kind of learning on the job because I, I, I'd only been working in the field for about a year at that time. But the good thing about working at the WTI, the World Trade Institute in Bern, is that I was working with some of the people who were literally the leading uh, figures in the field. Um, okay. So th there was a guy called Thomas Cotier who started it. He's generally recognized as being pretty solid on, on intellectual property issues and you know, there were guys like Joe Francois. He's now running the WTI, but he was considered one of the world's, you know, best trade economists. This guy called Richard Baldwin, who I also interacted yeah. with extensively, also considered one of the world's best trade economists. So um, your and, and the, list, the list just went on and on. Your hmm? proximity to these folks uh, made that their them as a fallback resource uh, knew that you would you would be able to do the job quite well because if you had any question you had these gods to just kind of reach out to, right? Well, I'd been interacting fairly intensively with these guys for at least a year, year and a half before I went out to, to Kyrgyzstan and, and, and these other countries. And so I already had some pretty good exposure to the field and I, I, I'd already been on kind of a learning curve um, that was fairly intense. I remember the first kind of year or so at the WTI was just a really steep learning curve. Uh, and so I'd, I'd had that experience and, and that learning before I started working um, specifically in the field. And then in the field, you, you kind of figure out what their needs are and then you, you, you learn uh, as much as you can about it. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, you do, have, you do have resources. And we, we had very close contact with the WTO secretariat. Mm. Uh, and that was also a resource for us as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, Look, most of the guys that get into development consulting were much older than I were. And they, they, you know, it's typically something you do at the end of your career, not at the beginning of your career. Right. There are a few exceptions to that. A few exceptions to that, but usually 
Um, the guys doing development consulting like I was doing were all much older, much more experienced. It's true. Um, but, uh, but it doesn't have to be that way, you know. No, that's, that's one of the reasons why I was uh, immediately impressed when I started looking at your profile. And I was seeing like, hey, how could this guy be this young unless he's just an absolute wonder kid? You know, it's, you, got, you had some good breaks as well along the way. I was very lucky. Yeah, no, I was very lucky. I, as you said, I had some good breaks. I mean, you know, I, the WTI was just starting when I was sort of hanging around, kind of looking uh, to jump ship. And they, they actually hired me because they, they wanted, um, they needed somebody whose first language was English. They yeah. needed somebody who was proficient in English. And we, I mean, we were in Switzerland at the time in German speaking Switzerland in Bern. And um, all of the, my colleagues, all the people on, on, you know, who I was competing with, they were all German speakers or French speakers, but they needed somebody who spoke English who could manage this master's program, which was going to be in English. And so that, that, you know, that helped me a lot, actually. Yeah. Do you, are there any, lucky. are there any founding principles of your trade philosophy that you try to bring to every negotiation? And then from that, uh, are you able to, to kind of critique some of the, uh, the uh, recent uh, big name uh, trade deals that have been discussed uh, with, you know, the Chinese ones and the, the central Latin American ones uh, that have been discussed? I imagine that you observe these closely. Look, I mean, there's a lot you can, it's easy to criticize, right? I mean, um, <laughs> it's much I, look, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very easy to criticize, obviously. But I mean, I, one of the one of the criticisms that I remember expressing, uh, specifically with regard to the recent um, FTA between the EU and Mercosur, was just the complete weakness of the the digital trade chapter, hmm. right? So if you look at the TPP, they have a they have a chapter on e-commerce, which was fairly groundbreaking. It is time um because you're going back three or four years now or if you look at the usmca has a chapter on digital trade also really kind of pushes the envelope to a certain extent and in the in the eu um mercosur fta there's really none of that and so i was just thinking you know this is like a 20th century trade agreement in the 21st century but on the other hand you know none of those markets were big exporters of those services so there was no real imperative there's no real imperative at the negotiating table. Oh, we need to have disciplines on this because they, you know, the 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 biggest exporters of digital services are, are the U.S. And so, whenever the U.S. gets into a trade negotiation with somebody, obviously they come to the table and they have demands, and so they move the envelope a little bit. So, as I said, it's easy to be critical, but um, but I, I have to say, like a lot of these FTAs now that you're seeing, they do focus a lot on uh, eliminating tariffs, and you know, they 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 bring tariffs down to zero over a period of five, 10, 15 years, depending on how sensitive the goods are um, that we're talking about. And that's all well and good, but um, really the, the problem with that is that, uh, there are two problems with that. First of all, um, the rules of origin usually make it pretty complex for any SMEs, the small and medium sized enterprises to actually know how to go about qualifying for those tariff preferences. So I think HSBC did some research a few years ago and showed that in the Asia Pacific region, even though there are all these FTAs in place, most of the goods trade, which is all in com components largely, um, and is all done or to a great extent is done by SMEs, they don't even bother um, trading on these pre under these preferential tariffs. It's just too hard for that, these small, and entrepreneurs to figure out, oh, how do I qualify for the preferential tariff, get the certificate of origin so, so that I can, I can get my goods in at a zero tariff. Mm. And then there are other countries that just um, ignore, like Indonesia is famous for just saying, oh, we've looked at your origin documents, but we think that's bullshit. We're not going to give you the uh, preferential tariff. You're paying MFN, um, MFN tariff, which is the highest, higher tariff. Mm. So even though we've got a lot of FTAs focusing very, um, intensely on tariffs, eliminating tariffs, a lot of trade is still just not going to happen under these preferential tariffs because it's too hard to qualify. That's number one. And the second criticism is we all know now that the biggest barrier is actually not tariffs, but it's non-tariff barriers. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's, you know, all this tomfoolery at the border, 
or it's uh -huh. um, or, or you know it's like um, sanitary and phytosanitary measures for food imports or it's um, it's uh, technical standards or other things so so really the the biggest trade barriers I see um, non tariff barriers now and they don't really tend to get negotiated in the context of FTAs uh, unless you're talking about really big FTAs um, with a whole range of trading partners like we saw in the TPP. In the TPP we actually saw some, some pretty um, important changes um, to non-tariff barriers, um, but I mean, most bilateral FTAs, they just, all they say is we agree to uh, apply the WTO agreement on technical barriers to trade and let's move on to the next chapter, right? So, so that, those, are, those are two kind of big weaknesses with, with FTAs now. And of course, they don't address issues like subsidies um, and there's, there's been some research that the biggest, the, the biggest front uh, along which protectionism has been advancing since um, the global financial crisis has actually been subsidies. So, you know, yeah. in FTAs, in FTAs, they don't address subsidies. What what um, what subsidies are, are kind of growing out of bounds? Um, well, I mean, if you think back to the the GFC, there were a lot of bailouts that were given to not only the banks but also to whole industrial sectors. Yeah. Um, uh, so so it it you know there's there's agricultural subsidies and then there's there's industrial subsidies. Um, what what we've seen actually now in in the the recent pandemic is that um, Governments have again kind of thrown whole industrial sectors and business business uh, businesses kind of um, lifelines, uh, and so again you've had this massive infusion of, of government money into the mm. private sector, and now it's, it just takes years to kind of roll that back, uh, and and that can create market distortions. Um, mm. But the interesting thing was after the global financial crisis and after all these bailouts like the automotive sector and etc. Um, you didn't actually see that many governments bringing uh, countervailing duty actions against other governments doing it. And the reason I think was because people that live in glass houses don't throw stones because everyone was doing it. And so, you know, they didn't want to kind of, um, they didn't want to throw a stone at one of their trading partners for something that they were doing themselves. Right? Uh, my president here in America is not really held back about throwing stones uh, uh, Kind of thing, despite how uh, how clear and transparent the our house is, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, Trump, Trump, you, what? Go ahead. I, no, I was going to say, look, Trump. Trump really uh, Trump really sort of is this kind of break with the status quo uh, in terms of how America's relations are with not only its allies, but you know how it stands with regard to all, you know, in, international institutions. And, um, and, and so, you know, it's, um, it, it's really, I, look, I think it, um, it, it's done a lot of damage. Uh, it's, it's done a lot of damage to uh, America's reputation overseas and American leadership um, at places like the WTO. And of course, where America steps back, China will step up, you know, so America is really, only hurting itself when when it says it's going to cut funding to the WTA, WHO or yeah. when it steps back from the UN or when it says it wants wants to yeah. abolish the WTO. Um, you know, I mean, we the the multilateral system did uh, did very well when it under American leadership, and and that's what's needed again. But it it doesn't look like it's going to happen under under Trump. Yeah, it'll be a really interesting thing to watch when we see uh, if someone new takes over in this next election. Um, I was going to refer back to a comment you were talking about, uh, about SMEs that were not able to take advantage of some of the uh, free trade categories. And I was wondering if you saw trade associations uh, kind of stepping in to provide the legal guidance to help them take advantage of that. Yeah, I mean, in some cases they do. I mean, we've seen that in Singapore. They have some very active trade associations that uh, that that do play the role of kind of educating their SMEs. Well, I, but I'm, when I when I said trade association, I meant like uh, specific ones, uh, such as uh, types of food manufacturers or um, people 
it, you could be an SME, but you're part of a, a association of some kind and, and playing that role. Yeah, I mean, look, um, a lot of SMEs, I mean, they, they really operate on very tight margins. And so they might not have the money to join an association. They would do a very careful kind of cost benefits analysis on, well, if I join this association and the dues could be several hundred, several thousand dollars a year, they, they might sort of ask, well, what, what do I, what's in it for me? Um, and so it's, it, it, and, and it tends to really only kind of work in, I, I would say in more, more advanced. I mean, that's not something that you typically see in LDC. Mm. But maybe in sort of larger middle income developing countries that yeah, that, I guess you're not going to get a lot of uh, uh, people like soybean farmers from Papua New Guinea that are you know <laughs> joining together in a trade association. I don't see that. No, look, Papua New Guinea that that doesn't really exist. A lot of you know the interesting thing to realize as well. So when we when we started doing. Um, so I was in I was in former Yugoslavia, so Bosnia Herzegovina. I, I spoke to Chamber of Commerce there, and then also in places like Mozambique, you know, we were engaging with the Chamber of Commerce there, and really they're just arms of the government. Um, and in 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 markets or in economies where you have a lot of corruption, as an SME, you want to stay as far away from the government as possible. You want the government to know as little about your business as possible. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and so. So you might, you, you know, you might um, have second thoughts about joining a chamber of commerce because, yeah, because that, that brings risks with it as well. I ran into that issue as well. I was a business advisor in Western Ukraine and uh, there was hardly a chamber of commerce of anything like that. There was an association of business owners, but they kept to themselves. And I guess the reason uh, was the, the historical background of government being a little too overbearing there. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember talking to a guy uh, who was a representative of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the EBRD, and they were very active in Central Asia at the time. And, and this guy told me, you know, he, he, um, he was sort of helping some SMEs and he, and, and, and he was kind of encouraging them to stay under the radar um, mm -hmm. and, and not to, to uh, make themselves too noticeable to, to government. Um, otherwise, they could you know, get some unwelcome attention and yeah. find themselves uh, the, you know, the, the target of a tax audit or something like that, right? So, you know, when, you know, in countries that, that experience a bit of corruption or high levels of corruption, yeah. that, that, that can be a problem. So that's, that's kind of the circular systemic problem that, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're really trying to avoid. And that's why we try to build more confidence in governments, right? Is so that, so that they can actually work to each other's benefit. Is. So anyway, um, I was one of the comments you made leads me to the next point. Uh, you you, had, you were talking about at the borders. Uh, you, you said tomfoolery, and uh, where where you and I kind of connected was uh, in regard to the paper you wrote about trade in FSM. Uh, my background was that I went there in 2015, and I spent about three months. Uh, developing my thesis about 3D printing and how it could be utilized uh, as a pioneering technology to reduce the need for the trade of goods uh, specifically or, or to, to make it so because, because okay, FSM, I, I just said, I mean, a lot, <laughs> what percentage of people listening to this podcast know what FSM is just offhand? That's the Federated States of Micronesia, which is basically the, uh, the extent of the global supply chain. It's like, it's like the end point. If the freeway ended somewhere, that would be just about where it ended because uh, they have a small population and they're on the way to nowhere, basically. Uh, so they end up getting the the very last of any supply and usually the lowest often the lowest quality of that that's degraded because what are they going to do ship it back you know and so uh they my my thesis was that if 3d printing could custom print uh end products end user products uh they could we could uh get the they could reduce the three to four week period of time that they often have to wait for anything that they order and get it printed on demand because there's rather small demand and these people have a, a very weak economy as a result. Uh, their GDP is somewhere like two to $3,000 a year, I think, 
per capita. And so you end up with a small group of poor people with the most expensive shipping rate in the world to get their end use product and the longest wait of time. So all of these factors may have a significant impact. And so my, my thesis is on 3D printing and, and back to the point I started to make was that to get the idea of how 3D printing could impact these people, I, I, I had to learn what they were importing first, like what things could be 3D printed that were imported. So I went to the, uh, the, the um, customs uh, people in Pohnpei and which is the main island. In fact, it's 90% of the whole land mass of, of the Federated States of Micronesia. It's, it's somewhere in that 75 to 90%. I can't remember the specific number because it's the only sizable rock out there. And the people at the customs and border, uh, they, they gave me these lists and the guy, when he's given it to me, he gave me a digital information which was great i didn't have to go to the government and ask for permission the guy was like eh, and that's kind of the style around there but as he gives it to me he goes now i don't know exactly how accurate all of this is and i'm i'm thinking i don't quite understand why would you say that right and of course the reason he says it is because there's such little oversight of the things actually coming in and the amount of inspection of all this people look at the uh what category and the taxation category of the item and they might be bringing in a piece of electronics but they say it's uh flower you know or it's whatever it's uh whatever category is is lower and and you got to assume that the numbers or you want to assume i don't have any reason to assume that the numbers are at least 60 to 80 percent accurate i don't know but i was really going through that import the import statistics to, uh, to determine what things came in sizable enough quantities to uh, represent a, an actual opportunity for reduction on that. So I would call that tomfoolery. <laughs> well, I mean, look, when I, when I talk about tomfoolery at the border, what I mean is, you know, the example I gave before of uh, Indonesian customs refusing to um, grant uh, preferential tariff to, uh, to imports because they, they refuse to recognize the certificate of origin or um, or just extremely long dwell times um, because it, it takes uh, sure. it takes so long to, to clear customs because you you know customs for whatever reason I mean they're just very slow in, in yeah. getting all the, the approvals um, together that you need to, to import something um, many import countries that way. well they yeah look I mean there are Countries are, are actually getting better at, at reducing dwell times and yeah. um, there's a big emphasis on, on clearing the border quickly, but I mean, uh, it's, it's also, you know, ports still represent a major source of, uh, of corruption and also um, uh, inefficiency and, uh, you know, rent-seeking behavior. Sure. And, uh, and it's really, I mean, you know, the thing about FSM is FSM is not a member of the WTO, right? And so one of the things I was there to do was to try to nudge them in the direction of at least um, applying to join the WTO and and even if, you know if they sent a letter saying that they would like to join the WTO it doesn't mean I mean they're not going to be in the organization you know for a few years and there's going to be you know a period of negotiation and um, do, they, do they feel that their interests are looked over by the US or what look I I, I Look, I think they, they feel as if their interests looked over uh, overlooked by everybody because they they're so marginal, as you say. Oh, oh I, mean, I meant looked over, but you're probably right. You know, <laughs> overlooked. <laughs> yeah, I mean the the interesting thing is that the 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 department in the U.S. that actually has um, bureaucratic or administrative jurisdiction over FSM is the Department of the Interior. Um, but actually, in reality, it's the Department of Defense is calling all the shots and making all the decisions as to what really happens at a political level about, uh, you know, with regard to FSM, because it, it falls in, into the sort of um, theater of operations of, of the U.S. Navy. And, mm -hmm. and the, reason why, the reason why the U.S. Um, pays $100 million a year to the FSM uh, is, is because of its significance. Um, in terms of just sort of staking the U.S.'s claim in, in the Western right. Pacific, and and uh, 
And so, you know, there was there wasn't there, there wasn't a lot of interest there in joining the WTO just because they didn't they didn't see the need really because they they get um they get all of this money from the US and so yeah. as long as that's there, there's no yeah. imperative to really change. Can you describe uh, just briefly as possible uh, what the the CFA is and like you know because you you mentioned that we pay a hundred the U.S. pays a hundred million dollars a year approximately right now and that's related to that I, I'm sure a lot of people aren't familiar with this agreement. Look, I it, it was ten years since I was on FSM, so I've forgotten a lot of the details myself. But my understanding was that um, after the Second World War, there was an arrangement. Yeah. Um, between a bunch of Pacific states. I mean, FSM is not the only one. I think the Marshall Islands will Marshall. have their own arrangement. And, yep. and, um, and basically, uh, the US agrees to hand them over a certain amount of money yeah. every year, no questions asked. And I think the money diminishes over time. Um, yep. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fill in some details here. It's the the way that the compact of free association works, uh, and they did this with with the Marshall and our Marshall Islands and also uh, Micronesia FSM, which are politically separate from each other. Yeah, but they were both part of the the original trust territories post World War II. Right. And what had happened was America said, we want you to be self-sufficient countries and sustainable and all that. So they, they took this giant amount of money and every year they would they'd have two pots of it. They've got the one that goes into the general budget and one that goes into this trust fund that is supposed that, that every year, the amount of money that they give, uh, the, the one going to the general budget goes down a little bit and this one goes up a little bit to the trust. And so then every year there's a declining amount of money, but more of it going this way. And, and as a result, the, the, at the end of it, they were supposed to be self-sufficient uh, or at least, you know, approximately that. And after 30 years of the agreement, it was uh, renewed again for another 30 years that runs through 2023. Um, however, the, the country has done relatively little to actually uh, achieve any kind of measurable benchmark or target uh, so that they could be self-sufficient. We're getting near the end of it. And as soon as the compact ends, you have uh, a gap of something like 8% of the budget or something between what they used to get in budgetary supplement and what is going to be provided by the, by the trust. Of course, you, you I don't think think this model even uh, bakes into it the what could happen to the value of those trust investments uh, given a global cata economic catastrophe that we're in right now. So that's that's another wrinkle in the whole program. Uh, it might be an excuse to get an extension again on this on this uh, supplement. Um, who knows? Well, I mean, look, 2023 isn't that far away, right? No. And so if you've got a guy, if you've got a guy like. Donald Trump in the White House, literally anything is possible. Right. There's no certainty with this guy. If you were if you were to get somebody else in the White House, who's probably more likely to listen to his to established advisors, to follow precedent. Um, and you know, I mean the because because again, this is a this is a, a classic case that if the if the US steps away, who's gonna step yeah. in? It's obvious. And that's China. why Trump might yeah. renew it, honestly, because as soon as if he pulled out of this agreement, he knowing that China would step in and being as protective or, you know, aggressive as he is on China, he might he might jump on it just for that sake. But, but see, the thing about Trump, the thing about Trump is he's also shown himself extremely willing to throw his national security people under the bus when it suits him yeah. and when it's politically expedient to him. Look what he did with North Korea. Look what he did with Putin. Yeah. And he keeps insisting that he has this great relationship with Xi. So, you know, if she says to him, hey, listen, uh, why don't you kind of let us manage these guys in the Pacific? Who used to say that Trump won't say, oh, no, you're right. And, yeah. and so that's, that's the thing. I mean, Trump is really kind of the wild card here. He really and, is. and so, you know, that I would think that people in the FSM are getting pretty nervous because of that. But also because of, as you write, I mean, you know, what you what you said is true. I mean, we've had this major catastrophe to equities markets, capital markets around the world. Um, so the value of the the trust fund must must be down, just like everything else is down. Hmm. But also because governments have had to step in and provide um, 
such you know wide scale financing to you know broad sectors of the economy like they did in back in in um, 2009 2010 what you're going to be looking at over the next few years is a few years of austerity where government budgets are going to be cut mm -hmm. and one of the places they're going to be looking to cut is aid budgets things that aren't that costly oh, yeah. politically right and and the fs the people in fsm don't vote you know they don't vote in the american election no, so they they're vulnerable right they're vulnerable to cuts. So I, I would think they're probably getting pretty nervous at this point. Well, I was, I was really interested to hear what you advised on uh, regarding trade in FSM because uh, one of the, the only source of revenue they have besides this uh, are fishing licensing uh, that they primarily sell to the Chinese. And the Chinese go, okay, we're gonna give you this much money for this much fish. And then as soon as you turn around, it's this much fish, you know, that's, it's really, mm -hmm. really over, over taxing. It's very difficult to police that, right? And without, uh, without your own Navy. Um, but uh, look, I just, I just found that, um, that the problem with this whole compact arrangement is that it, it created this uh, relationship of very unhealthy dependency Mm -hmm. whereby the FSM didn't really need to do anything in order to get this money. They and um, marks about being sustainable, like you have to achieve this if you want, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, in theory, if it's a trust fund, you know, if it's, if it's invested just like any other sovereign wealth fund, um, it should be set up in a way so that when it expires, uh, it should be self-sustaining and, and it should be enough to cover um, the, 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 public, uh, the public expenditure needs of, of the country. Mm. Um, but of course, those needs, they vary over time. And as people get older, you know, you need more. Although life expectancy isn't so high on FSM as well. You know, the interesting thing about FSM and the Marshall Islands, I mean, in the Marshall Islands, you've got something like a third of the population that are in the US. And mm. in FSM as well, because they have... Um, they have unfettered access to the U.S. labor market. They a lot of them end up joining the armed services um, or just migrating to the U.S. anyway because they can work there, right? And so once they get they get off FSM, they they do and they just send remittances home. Yeah, right? that's 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 a real characteristic so if, of the economy. So w that's another impact the the global uh, crisis has there is the loss of remittances. I've been reading about this all over the world. That's a big deal. Well, they have they have access to the U.S. labor market, but then they might not have access to uh, unemployment insurance in the U.S. Uh, I don't probably. know. Well, you've yeah. been very generous with your time, and I could talk to you all day. But uh, I know it's I know it's getting into the evening there, and uh, I, I like I'm just very grateful to to be able to reach out to you and uh, to hear your ideas on these things. Thanks for being so uh, yeah generous, uh, Simon. Yeah, happy to talk to you.